Hi, I'm Stanley Goldberg, host of the Inquiring Mind podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you're new here, I release two episodes a week with a variety of fascinating guests. And I would appreciate if you would support my podcast by liking this video and subscribing down below. Thank you for your support. And now to today's guest. Maxwell King, welcome to the Inquiring Mind podcast. So uh, before we get into, you know, the ins and outs of your book, which I have right here, The Good Neighbor, which I, I mentioned before we started recording that I, I thoroughly enjoyed and I regret not reading it earlier. Um, can I ask probably the most basic question is what appealed to you about Fred Rogers and why did you decide to write the book? Uh I first met Fred Rogers over 20 years ago when I was uh, running a foundation in Pittsburgh called the Heinz Endowments, uh, which is a pretty big uh, charitable foundation and had a long history of funding Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So I was invited to come over and talk with Fred Rogers in his office. And I assumed it would be a discussion about money, funding, programming, but it was none of those. I went and sat in his office. He doesn't sit behind a desk. He sat on a sofa and I sat in a chair. And we just talked about life for an hour and a half. It was really kind of remarkable. So that got me interested in him, but then it was probably another eight, nine years after that, that I retired from the foundation and, uh, the chancellor of St. Vincent College, which is in La Trobe, Pennsylvania, which is where Fred Rogers grew up. And it's about um, 40 miles or so east of Pittsburgh. The chancellor of St. Vincent uh, was starting something called the Fred Rogers Center for Early Learning and Children's Media. Uh, Fred had left all his professional legacy to St. Vincent to establish this center to continue his work uh, after he died. And, and he, he did all this uh, before he died. So he had established that this was, and in fact, Fred had planned to be there at the center, working at the center. Uh, basically, I think his idea was that at this college, he could teach teachers who would do exactly uh, what you're doing. Uh, so uh, the Arch Abbott, or excuse me, the chancellor approached me and asked me to come out and help him kind of get the center going, get programs going, raise money, all that sort of stuff. And after I was there for a little while, I said to him and to Joanne Rogers, Fred Rogers' widow, who just died last year. She's absolutely one of the most charming, nice, thoughtful people I've ever known in my life. Uh, I said to the two of them, uh, you know, if I'm going to be successful in getting a lot of interest in the center, raising money and all that, we should have a biography of Fred. Why is there no biography of Fred? And they told me that when Fred was alive, he didn't want a biography to be done of him because he wanted it to be about the children, not about him. And I said, with all due respect, Fred's gone now. And if we're going to get the center going, we need to figure out how to tell his story. Well, eventually what it led to was uh, Joanne Rogers asked me after a long discussion, finally, the, Joanne and the family and the chancellor all agreed we needed the biography. And then um, Joanne asked me if I would write it. She knew I'd been a, a journalist for 30 years before I went into running uh, foundations and uh, not appreciating how much work it was. Uh, I said yes, and that's how I got started on it. And in that conversation in your office that lasted, you said, an hour and a half, um, you said you discussed, you know, family and, and life in general. Um, how, what, do you, what do you most remember about that conversation? What most drew you into Fred Rogers? I was in Fred's office, by the way, not mine. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I went there to see him. Um, there are a couple of things, I think, uh, two very important things. First of all, he, you know, I started out questioning him, asking him a lot of questions about the program, because that's what we do in, in foundation work. If you're considering funding 
somebody asked a lot of questions. But Fred quickly turned it all around and he changed the subject from the program to life. And he changed the, um, the subject of the conversation from him to me. And he asked me a lot of questions. Uh, and it wasn't just a device. He was very sincere. I think that uh, what struck me then, and as I did the research on the book, it was reaffirmed a thousand times. F Fred's greatest interest in life was people. He loved meeting people, learning about them, having a relationship with people. And so uh, that really struck me at that first meeting and, and why kind of in the back of my mind was, boy, there's, there's so much more to be explored here. But the other thing that struck me was um, because Fred kind of slows everything down, because Fred, uh, takes you know, the pace of daily life that is often so frenetic. And it certainly was for me when I was working at the Heinz Endowments. Uh, and he just, he's, he's quiet, he's slow paced. Everything sort of quiets down and slows down. You have a really, really interesting, intimate conversation with someone that in the rest of the day, the rest of the week, the rest of the month, you almost never have. So it was the depth of character that I encountered that day that really piqued my interest. Have you ever encountered anybody else in your life that was very similar to Fred Rogers or that made you feel the same way that you did in that conversation? It, at different, in different ways, yes. I don't think I ever met anybody who combined both the thoughtfulness, the engagement, uh, the uh, responsiveness to, to people that Fred embodied and the pacing that Fred embodied. You know, for Fred's, Fred believed, I think the single most important thing to Fred was to be a good person, was to be kind. More important than his program, than education, than his puppets, more important than anything was that he wanted to be a good person. He wanted to be kind and thoughtful to everybody uh, that he met. And he was, everybody. I mean, people on the street, uh, homeless people, uh, bank presidents, it didn't matter to Fred, that they were all the same. Uh, and then the other aspect of him uh, was that um, he, he believed very strongly that you couldn't have these interesting relationships that he cared about and that he, he thought could express the kind of human kindness that, that he really believed in. You couldn't have those kind of relationships if you're rushing around everywhere going 100 miles an hour. And so he not only made sure his pacing was slow. I mean, for the children on the program, it made sense because they could then follow him. But in his personal life, he was just the same way, very slow. There's a, a story that a friend of mine told who was a producer at WQED, the PBS station here in Pittsburgh, that uh, he got a, he was up on, I don't know, the fourth or fifth floor of the, the building and he got a call from down in the studio, the director who was filming some a program, not Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, but another program. And there was a big kind of a uh, kerfuffle on the set that two, two performers were arguing with each other and so he got a call as the producer to come downstairs to the floor and settle the dispute so they could go on filming. So he got on the elevator at the fourth floor and on the third floor, Fred got up and Fred took one look at his face and he pushed the stop button on the elevator. And he said, Dan, you need to calm down. Think of what a wonderful person you are. What a good job you do here for us how wonderful your family is, uh, you, you know, you, you're going to go on down uh, and deal with that, whatever you're going to deal with, but slow down first, because you've got all the ability in the world to handle this. So uh, Dan Fails, his name was, then got down to the studio and was very calm and centered and, and brought the whole thing down and settled it all. Uh, and one of the cameramen, a guy named Nikki Tallow, looked over at Dan and said, pure Fred. <laughs> um, 
So there's a lot to, in my opinion, to unpack there. So for one, you just alluded to the fact that he was very kind to everyone he met, not yes. just people professionally, but people that, you know, random people on the street he's never met. Do you think that's a natural ability for him? Or was that something he worked on constantly to be always aware that he the people looked up to him, that people expected a certain level of kindness. And I think I, I heard a conversation once between um, you know, people that were famous saying it doesn't take much, but for those people that you encounter, it means the world to them right. that you would stop and be nice. Right. Uh, because if you have a moment where everyone has a bad day, but if you're able to turn that off and still be nice, that's yes. a skill. Is, is. So, so do you think for Fred Rogers, was that a skill or just a natural ability? It was a skill that he developed very young and that he worked on for the whole rest of his life. When Fred was a little boy, five, six, seven, eight years old, he was extremely shy. He was overprotected by his parents. He was bullied, <clears throat> excuse me, bullied by other children. And he had a great, he had a great struggle. He, he was good academically in school. But he had a great struggle going to school because he was so shy. And, you know, his parents did things like send him to school in the limousine, which, you know, if you want to get beat up in third grade, that's how to do it. Come mm -hmm. to school in the limousine. And, uh, and he was picked on. And about the age, somewhere around 10, 11, 12, and this is principally because he had such a great mentor in his grandfather. His grandfather was wonderful to him and, and gave him a lot of wisdom and encouraged him a lot. Uh, Fred, you can see a shift in Fred. I mean, physically, you can see a shift. He was a chubby little boy who suddenly became thin, and, and his face in the early pictures looks like a deer in the headlights, and his face at 11 and 12 has a confidence in it. He made a shift, and, and I think I can even uh, trace it to the day that it happened. This is taking some journalistic liberties, I suppose, and saying I can do that. But one day he was chased home from school and, and he went by some bullies. And he went to a neighbor's house, a friend's house, and she took him in and got his parents and they came and picked him up. And when he got home, his parents said to him, oh, Freddie, just pretend you don't care. Show them you don't care and they'll leave you alone. And Fred went up to his room and he thought to himself, I do care. It's the one thing about me that is so strong. I care, I really care. So he began to think about how could he take his vulnerability and his uh, openness and turn it into a strength. And I think he very deliberately then, at that young age, began crafting uh, the Mr. Rogers persona. It first showed up as a high school student who was incredibly successful. He's president of the class, editor of the yearbook, National Merit Scholar, um, all sorts of honors in high school. Uh, and, and his demeanor changed. He wasn't afraid of being bullied anymore, but he was gentle and kind and, and he crafted this persona. And then it grew through the years into the, the Fred Rogers persona of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. But I know that Fred was dedicated to working hard to be kind, that he understood what you just described, uh, some other celebrities, although I, I hesitate to call Fred a celebrity, he'd hate that, <laughs> uh, mentioned to you. Uh, he knew that um, it takes a lot of work to be a good person. That, it, that even if your instinct is to be a good person, if you're careless, if you're not very, very deliberate and intentional about how you live your life, it can slip away from you. And Fred was intentional in every aspect of his life. For example, Fred woke up every morning at 5 a.m. to pray and read the Bible before he went to the Pittsburgh Athletic Association to swim. That was how he got his exercise every morning. Interestingly, when he prayed, he didn't pray for success for his program or for a bigger audience or for anything personal. 
uh, what he prayed for was that he could be as good a person as he possibly could that day. And he actually did some envisioning the way you probably read about an athlete envisioning an athletic event, you know, how, how it's going to, how the race is going to go, how it's going to shape up, how should I perform at this stage of the race? And he envisioned that day in terms of everybody he was going to meet. So he thought about who is he going to see at work that day? Who is he having lunch with? Who is he going to see in the afternoon? And how could he be as thoughtful and kind and responsive as he could? So you know, Fred made it a work, uh, a labor of love, a work of art to be a good person. Yeah. One of the earlier things that you brought up was his interest in people. Again, not just kids. And I think that extended, I, I learned one of the interesting things I learned in your book was the fact that he left his children's programming to start a uh, programming for adults. And there he interviewed a lot of prominent people, right? which shows his interest in, um, in talking to people and really hearing them out and hearing their side of the story. The, the, the show itself, as you mentioned, did not quite pan out. I didn't uh, think so, but but, but what the interesting thing about the, the, the lesson I drew out of it is whenever you, le uh, whenever you read a book about uh, personalities in history that have left their stamp on any profession, they have no fear of – they almost have no fear of failure. And the fact that he, sac he almost sacrificed something that was so successful that was – uh, almost a guarantee to a certain point to then go into the unknown and explore that territory without fear and with the courage of his convictions that he, he knew it could pan out and he would do everything in his power to make it work um, is inspirational. And I think that's one of those little um, character traits that we all could kind of take away from a person yeah. like Fred Rogers. Yeah. One of the things when he was in high school and shaping that persona that then became his consistent character for the rest of his life, one of the things that he uh, really focused on was being fearless. He gave up the fears of, of being bullied and then he was willing to try anything. I mean, in high school, he did everything in addition to being very successful academically. He performed in a theater program. And then for the rest of his life, you see Fred taking on one thing after another. Uh, he, he was a music major. He was a composer. He composed 200 songs and 13 operas. Uh, he became a writer. He did a lot of books, a lot of speeches, a producer. You know, when, when he came out of college, um, he very fearlessly went to New York and got an internship with a little help from his father at NBC. And in, in two and a half years, taught himself a whole new profession uh, that he had not been trained for in, in college. And then um, when he got to WQED and he started the Children's Corner, which was a precursor to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, uh, he brought the puppets out from his childhood. He had played with puppets as a child. And his wife, Joanne, said she had no idea. <laughs> there, were, there were these dozens of puppets, but he brought them out and started using them on that program. So he was always taking a step uh, forward. He challenged himself enormously. I mean, he was a really, really busy guy right up until uh, the month that he died. Yeah, in your book, you write that uh, you know, Fred played piano, was interested in religion, uh, became a minister, yes. uh, worked in childhood education with uh, Dr. Margaret McFarland, which we will discuss right. in a bit, right. um, worked in TV production. Um, and all of that kind of demonstrates the range of ability that Fred Rogers had. Uh, and it reminded me, I even wrote it in the book of a different book I, I, I read probably a few years ago. Uh, by this man named David Epstein, who wrote a book called Range. And in that book, he says that 
um, a lot of times people tell you, especially in college, and you, you encounter these people or professors that tell you, you know, pick something you're very good at and just pursue it for the rest of your life. And um, I've never been to that. That's that theory has never appealed to me. And I always kind of maybe I look for confirmation bias, but I knew there was something out there that disproved that theory. And yeah. this man wrote a book about range and he goes through these different people of history that have experimented with so many different things. And I, it just shows with Fred Rogers how trying so many different things, actually, they, they all come, kind of came together exactly. into, into this exactly. beautiful show. That's what Fred said. You know, he did all these different things, and instead of sequentially having to give them up to go do something else, he brought them together in something that was harmonious and worked. But I know Fred uh, considered, <coughs> excuse me, that um, everybody had that capability of a wide range, and that one of the mistakes in life was to keep narrowing yourself out of concern about how successful you were going to be. I think it's good advice to pick something you really like and focus on it. But the problem is, if you focus on it exclusively without having uh, the range and the flexibility to try other things, you really limit your life. And I think that kind of advice in college reflects um, the current intellectual dichotomy in colleges today. They're really not sure whether they're job training institutions or they're, they're about uh, the, tr the uh, tradition of intellectual inquiry. So if you go to college just to get prepared for, for a job and focus on one thing, uh, yeah, it probably increases the chance that you'll get a job. I don't think it increases the chance that you'll be successful and happy. I think the way to do that is use those few years of college, which give you the greatest possible opportunity to be wide ranging in your interests to, to explore everything, not just what you're going to work on, but how you're going to live your life. And that Fred very much believed in that. Yeah, I think also those same people that gave give that advice, and maybe they did become successful in whatever profession they went into, uh, they give that advice, maybe also forgetting that they took some risks and they took chances right. and they, they tried different things before they yeah. settled on this profession. We, right. I forgot right. the psychological term, but there's a, there's a tendency. We like to kind of block out all the things we did before we got to where we got to. Um, and I think it can't be stressed enough with a person like Fred Rogers and, and a lot of very uh, influential personalities in history that, failure is so central and right, right. and and the experimentation of different professions or just just trying things and yes. and right. i think and i think that also translates into people's curiosity i think one of the greatest qualities you can have as a human being is this ability to always be curious you know why is this guy, yeah that why is friend. Right. Yeah. Why, why is the sky blue? Why is it? I mean, it's snowing out my window right now. Why is it snowing? So you know, I, lo I looked at hundreds of Mr. Rogers neighborhood episodes and doing research for the book. And that's what they're all about with the children. He will pick something like, why is the sky blue? Uh, why, why do the fish, uh, how do the fish feed in the right. tank? And he'd explore these things for children. And it was educational. It was part of his educational strategy but it was also um, his own interest. He was always curious about how things worked. Uh, so he, he would take his, his, his kids to a mechanic shop to see how the cars were fixed, to a bakery to see how the big pretzels were baked and, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. I, um, in my jobs running foundations, I had lots of uh, young people, college or right out of college who would come and asked my advice. And I made a rule for myself that because I'd been lucky enough to do jobs that I really liked and that were interesting, I had to always give people some time. So I did. And the advice I gave them was definitely have a plan, have a plan, a, a roadmap for what you want to do and where you think you're going. And then realize you will not follow the plan. 
There are going to be lots of opportunities that are going to come, and you should respond to the opportunities. So you have the plan as a baseline, sort of an idea of where you want to go, but always be flexible and be in a position to respond to the opportunities when they come, because they're probably going to be more interesting than the plan. Well, maybe to leave Fred Rogers for uh, a five for for a second or so. Um, when was when was was there ever a time in your life that? Uh, maybe you had a plan of what you wanted to accomplish uh, early on, and then that all was derailed, or you just went in a completely different direction in in pursuit of you know a job or or advancement in some other field. I guess the biggest moment in my life was after I'd spent uh, twenty five years as a journalist. Uh, I suddenly left that profession and t- took a job running a foundation. Uh, and moved from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, uh, all of which puzzled my friends. They couldn't figure out why I'd leave journalism or or why I'd leave Philadelphia. But uh, my wife, Peggy, and I just thought, this seems like something exciting. It could be exciting. And it it turned out to be a a spectacularly wonderful move for us. We loved Pittsburgh, and I loved the work of community building, which, you know, if if you're running a newspaper, you're very involved in all the issues in the community, but as an observer, not as a participant. So I love that. Uh, you know, I think that's probably the biggest moment for me. Another one was uh, when I was in college, after your first year, you had to declare a major. And my mother really wanted me to be a lawyer. So I declared government as a major. And then I thought, oh, damn, I don't want to do that. Mm. <laughs> I don't want to study government. I don't want to be a lawyer. So I quit college and I went in the merchant marine for a little bit more than a year, traveled all around the world. And when I came back, I changed the major to English literature and had a great time in college just reading really good books. <laughs> interesting. I think, um, yeah, that, that's an interesting pursuit, especially. Um, well, can you describe that one year of um, merchant being? you know, traveling the world? What was that like? Well, it was, it was fascinating and really educational. Uh, you know, I went to, to Europe, to Egypt, to the Red Sea, to uh, Pakistan, uh, India, uh, Sri Lanka, all sorts of places, places on the, on the East Coast of Africa. Uh, but I think the single biggest lesson I got from it was I didn't want to work with my hands and my body for the rest of my life. I wanted to have a pursuit that was more working with my mind. So that was really valuable because when I quit college, I thought, oh, I don't want to do government. Maybe I don't want to do college. But I I learned um, it sort of turned me back, not in the same direction, but in a variation of the the same direction. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to put ideas into your head or, or words into your mouth, but I would imagine one of the difficulties or the challenges that you've experienced was uh also writing this book because you went from uh being a journalist for so many years to now running a foundation and then um you're called upon sort of to write this book not knowing exactly what that entails exactly uh what was what was that like well um i did i had written hundreds of newspaper articles editorials, op-eds, lots of magazine articles. I wrote for a lot of different magazines. But of course, none of that is anything like a full-length history or biography, a a full-length work. Uh, And so I did not appreciate how complicated it was going to be. But uh, one of the great advantages I had when when I said yes, and I had to start doing something meaningful about it. And I really didn't have any idea how to structure a book. But uh, David McCullough, the great uh, historian and writer from Pittsburgh, uh, who I happen to know uh, from out here, uh, agreed to talk to me for a few hours uh, for an afternoon up at his his place on Martha's Vineyard and gave me a lot of good advice. And, And probably the best piece of advice he gave me was, when you're doing your research, and you think, oh, here's, here's the broad field of inquiry where I'm working. 
get off the field, go into the woods, follow the research wherever it goes. It doesn't matter whether it gets into your book or not. Don't do the research thinking, well, I'll continue this because it'll make a chapter in my book, but I won't do that because I said, follow anything interesting wherever it goes. And it'll provide the underpinning for your book. It'll provide the, 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 the uh, sensibility for your book. That, uh, that was just hugely good advice. Another piece of great advice he gave me was, um, he said, when, when are you gonna start writing? I've been researching for about three or four months when I went to see him. And I said, well, I'm gonna research for two and a half years and then I'll write. No, said David, mm -hmm. that's not the right approach. He said, you've got to start writing now, right away. Write while you research, because the act of writing will change the nature of your research, change your understanding. As you write, all the questions are going to come up that you, that you need to answer. He said, it doesn't matter whether you write something at the beginning or the middle or the end. It doesn't even matter whether what you're writing ultimately gets in the book. But if you're writing while you're researching, your research will be deeper, richer, and much better. I think that I did what he suggested. I think the first thing I wrote was the uh, hearing where Fred went to Washington to uh, testify before Congress on behalf of uh, funding for uh, public television. And where did, what was one of the most interesting directions that um, your research took you or your your writing. Uh, David McCullough mentioned that you have to just go into the woods. Wh where yeah. was the, where was, what was one of those moments where you just didn't expect something to happen or, or the research to take you somewhere and, and it just did? Well, I, I started doing a little bit of research on television, the history of television, how it evolved both technologically and commercially. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, you know, because Fred worked in television, but I realized that, you know, the book's about Fred. It's not about what happened in 1890 in Germany when they were uh, researching a cathode ray tube. But it was so damn interesting. I just kept reading and reading. And then I got some books on television, history books. I must have read three books on how television evolved. Ultimately, it was not more than a page and a half in the book. So I put in weeks of research that had very little payoff in terms of direct uh, content in the book. But it was, it just really gave me an understanding of what Fred was dealing with in a way that I would not have had an understanding because commercial television started in the 1940s. That's when the first broadcast started. I think it was 46, 47. And it was 1950 when Fred went, in, went to NBC in television. He was there at the very beginning of commercial television. And it helped me understand, Fred, that something so new, so unproven, and at that point, not particularly successful from a commercial standpoint. Of course, now television is, is one of the greatest influences in our culture, maybe the greatest influence in our culture. Yeah, I think it probably is the great, you know, the automobile and television would be the two. Um, and uh, all this research I did, it was, it was fascinating, but it was useful to me because I, I had an understanding of what Fred was coming up against in the 1950s as he began to formulate his approach and what was going on in the world of television, which in the 19, television started out with tons of really good programming in the early 50s. And in the mid 50s, there, there was a lot of wonderful programming, a lot of cultural programming. Um, NBC itself uh, was famous for doing the symphony, operas, plays, all sorts of cultural programming. And by the 1960s, it had shifted dramatically toward anything that was commercially successful. So it shifted from interesting, engaging content for viewers to whatever sells cereal and, and uh, uh, laundry detergent. Yeah. And, it, and as a result, it went way, way down in terms of the quality of the programming, the interest of the programming, except for 
PBS and the BBC and things like that. And then right at the end of Fred's life, and he lived long enough to see this, with cable, really good quality programming came back and then became a tsunami in television. Now, you know, people, people watch all the cable channels because they can watch, they have a, a, a huge variety of great stuff. So that, that interesting history uh, was something Fred was living with every day of his life and was very useful to me. When reading your book, and then um, I mentioned before we started talking that I watched the documentary about Fred Rogers' neighborhood, and then... Uh, Did you notice and, I'm in it? Uh, no, I didn't. It. It's like, for, they, they kind of used me like a Greek chorus. So about there's about four different very brief interviews with me uh -huh. where they ask me a question and the answer to the question sets up their next segment. Uh, oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll have to watch it again to, yeah. to, to catch it. It's worth watching more than once. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the documentary and then the movie with um, Tom Hanks, and which is, I actually think less about Fred Rogers than about Exactly. Uh, the, the journalist, uh, yeah, Tom G Genode. Am I correct? In, Tom in Genode, yeah, yeah. Um, but what I've I really appreciate about Fred Rogers is that he, and you mentioned this in your book, really valued silence over noise, um, and he was very almost prescient in the in his realization that noise was taking over the world yes, and exactly. we live in a world now with social media and 24-hour news and streaming netflix the ceo of netflix saying his greatest competitor is not is not another like hulu or hbo it's sleep <laughs> um so I heard that. <laughs> yeah and, and when you live in a world full of that i think for young people especially it's very difficult to find peace and silence yeah. and when watching his even the documentary clips you're watching and you go he's uh, the, the famous scene where he's trying to put together a tent and he's yeah. failing at it you're watching it and you're like almost drawn into it because it's it it's real it's real time and and that's probably how i would look putting together a tent on national <laughs> television or just if nobody was watching um and there's a beauty to it. So where do you think kids can find um, silence in the world today? And why was silence so important to Fred Rogers? I think silence, <clears throat> quiet, was, was important to Fred because it gave space. It gave space for feelings. It gave space for relationships. And I guess where I would suggest young kids might be able to find that today is in nature, to go to the park, go, go out into the woods and experience nature. That slows you down whenever you do that. Um, and you know, for a young kid to have the discipline to get off social media and do that is not likely. So it, it's gonna take parents to sort of try to <coughs> coax them outside. But you mentioned another attribute of Fred that, uh, that I found fascinating, which was his uh, willingness to portray failure, his willingness to portray something that didn't work out. One, one day at the opening of the program, you know, where he takes off his jacket, puts on the sweater, puts on the sweater and he buttons it up the wrong way. So it's all buttoned on. And he kind of laughs and says something to the kids, unbuttons it and buttons it up right. And then the producer said, well, we'll just cut that out, Fred do it again. And he said, no, no, we're not going to cut it out. I make mistakes. They make mistakes. They're going to see me make a mistake and how I handle it. And then there was another uh, wonderful episode where Fred uh, was doing, uh, I think it was a theme week, a whole week on noise. Mm -hmm. And he, the noise of garbage trucks, the noise of sirens, the noise of the trolley in town. <laughs> the noise of, you know, the, the birds that are singing. And he wanted to show uh, noise underwater because, you know, whales make noise, 
certain fishes make noise. Uh, when you're scuba diving, it makes noise. The bubbles make noise. So he went, uh, he went with a, a uh, oceanographer named Sylvia Earle, very famous oceanographer. And they went scuba diving together. <coughs> and Fred had a sound crew underwater with him. They filmed everything. And they came back up and there was no noise. There was nothing on the tape. That's okay. Fred showed it to the kids and he explained what he'd been looking for and that he didn't get it and why he didn't get it. Uh, the technology just didn't pick up what, what he and Sylvia Earle were feeling. So I think that that's such an important aspect of Fred that it's part of his honesty. And it's why children responded to him because he wasn't, he wasn't crafting a performance. He was being authentic and real in everything he presented to them. Right. Um, so one of the most interesting characters when reading the book uh, is we we mentioned her early on, earlier on is uh, Dr. Margaret McFarlane. And I have a little bit of a not backstory with Margaret McFarlane, but I remember hearing that name a while back. So if well, and uh, because you teach young children. Yeah, right. But but even I think freshman year of college or maybe yeah freshman year of college i got i, I binge read m most of david mccullough's books oh and so and i have a tendency to when i get really into a person or a character i just i then go on youtube and i try to search up every oh, interview they've ever yeah. done and and um and in one interview i think uh it was at the library of congress david mccullough was talking about uh, Dr. Margaret McFarland. That's why I rang a bell when I was reading the book. And then you mentioned D David McCullough at the end of the chapter. Yeah. Um, and one of the fascinating tidbits that I took from that conversation uh, that David McCullough had was that he said, Margaret McFarland has a great line. Uh, skills, I believe, skills are not taught, they're caught. Exactly. And I, when I heard that, I just knew he was right. And she was right because, yeah. because when you go to school and you have a very passionate teacher on a topic that you might not even care about, um, if you had a great, uh, I don't know, people don't teach wood shop anymore, but I would imagine like wood shop teacher or a, a phys ed teacher that was really passionate about their job, um, you catch that enthusiasm and you almost want to impress them and be like them and learn the skills that they have. So it's not always like do this, do this, do this, and you'll learn how to, you know, be a scientist or, or whatnot. It's look at how, look at how this person behaves and acts and how much they love what they do. And you will just catch it. Um, it's, it's why experiential learning is so important. And, and, you know, schools, that focus exclusively on instructional learning mm -hmm. and don't include much in the way of experiences for children, particularly young children of the age that you teach, um, just fail to communicate so much to the children. Margaret McFarland, uh, who was running a preschool called the Arsenal School in Pittsburgh, it was a, it was a research institute, but it was also a model preschool. Years and years, this is 1950s. Uh, she had a sculptor. She invited a sculptor, a local sculptor from Pittsburgh to come in to, to see the class. And he came to her and he said, well, now what do you want me to talk about? Do you want me to talk about myself, how I got into it? Do you want me to talk about the work? Do you want me to talk about other sculptors? Do you want me to talk about it? And she said, I don't want you to talk, just make something. <laughs> And so he was in this class of little preschool kids actually making with clay a sculpture. And they were riveted, they were fascinated. The, the class was, was quiet and totally absorbed. And that's having a skill, an understanding caught instead of taught. Yeah, I, um, I remember, you know, this makes me think about how we teach kids today. And it, it is very heavily, you know, one, it's test-based. We teach everything to, to 
to take a certain test and um which is is very disappointing to see um because especially when it's very young kids you see that they have so much curiosity they're always looking around and and to, to channel all of that creative energy and creative um, expression towards taking a standardized test just seems futile and, and, and yeah, I, I think it just seems useless to me, but, but what's, what I found most interesting is that when, when reading a great book, and this is the best example I could give when reading a great book, a person that um, maybe a great work of fiction that you really love and, or a great biography, like the one you've written, or, you know, the books of David McCullough or Robert Caro or Ron Chernow, the masters of, of their craft. I remember every time I read a book like that, or by one of those people, I feel like, man, I wish they were one of my teachers when I was growing up because, yeah. but they don't, they don't, it's not that they are teaching you anything because you can't hear their voice while reading the book. It's, you get this, this feeling inside of like wonder and excitement. And I remember when reading Ron Chernow's book about Hamilton, I, I lived in Brooklyn at the time. Um, and he was describing the battle of uh, Long Island, I think. Mm -hmm. And it, it happened at Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. Uh, and I lived maybe a 15 minute walk from wow. Greenwood Cemetery. And all I did is I just put my book down Next day, I woke up and I just went to Greenwood Cemetery. Yeah, and there was that excitement of just exploring your own exactly. city, and and I think uh, David McCullough actually brought this up in an, another interview where um, you give kids this, you know, instead of testing and all that, yes. you give them you give them a case study saying, uh, yeah. "Here's a president, you know, go find out stuff about presidents. Let kids explore for themselves. No, right. no restrictions, no barriers, right. no nothing." Yeah. and see what they come up with, it would be incredible. And yeah, I, I think- agree. I agree. Uh, you, you know, kids are learning machines. That's, a, you know, all they do is eat shit and learn. That's <laughs> they are learning. When they're playing, they're learning. When they're with their parents, they're learning. When they go outside, they're learning. And so they're voracious about learning. And I, I'll give you a couple of examples of things that, because the, the, the response of adults to how children are learning is so critical to whether they have the right opportunity or not. Like almost everybody in, in the country, I was in a grocery store once where a mother was wheeling a cart and the kid was in the cart. And as, it, as she wheeled it down the uh, aisle, the kid kept reaching out and touching packages and trying to pull a pack. Well, the kid was learning all these colorful, red, yellow, green things are going by. And she kept smacking his hand and saying, no, don't touch that. Don't touch that. So what she was saying is, no, don't learn. Don't learn anything. And then uh, maybe a month after that, I was in an office building that had an educational, had a school up on one of the higher floors. And that's where I was going. And I got on with a grandmother who had a little kid in her arms. And... She had the little kid push the floor where they, where they were going, you know, took his finger and said, this is where we're going. And then she turned to me, where are you going, sir? And I said, such and such a floor. And the little boy pushed that. And she explained to him why the pushing the button would get them to the floor. And that's, you know, that kind of a response uh, to just where... Parents of very young children think that, oh my God, they have this huge complicated job. Not really, you don't have to buy baby Einstein or all sorts of other gimmicks like that. If you just talk to kids, respond to kids, mm -hmm. um, that's enough. And, and if you're explaining things to, to them, I once saw my daughter-in-law who lives up in Vermont, uh, standing at the sink washing dishes and her little boy was on a stool beside her and washing the dishes she explained to him where the water came from what water is why water flows all that. those opportunities are limitless with little children but if you try to force particularly a young child you know this far better than i 
because you're teaching them into a box where they have to sit very still and just get instructed on what things mean, they're far less likely to learn anything useful than if they experience it. Yeah. Uh, There's an interesting video I once saw with Neil deGrasse Tyson, a famous astrophysicist. Uh, he was in Central Park and he was walking and he saw this uh, mother walking with her child, you know, small child, maybe two years old or so. And there was a, I guess it had rained the day before and there was a giant puddle in the, in the, uh, um, I guess pathway or whatever. And the, the kid you could see is sizing up this puddle and is like, I want to jump in. Yeah. But the, but the mom, what, you know, what the mom does is just take his arm and drag him around the puddle. And he goes, there, there was a moment for childhood experimentation and yes. learning that was just ripped away. Exactly. Uh, um, that, that reminds me of a Fred Rogers story. When he was about nine, eight or nine years old, he, his grandfather had a farm uh, just north of Latrobe. And he was at the farm with his mother and grandfather and grandmother. And he climbed up on a stone wall and he was, you know, as mm -hmm. little kids will do, he was trying to walk along the top of the stone wall, which is hard because the different stones are different shapes. And the mother and grandmother said, oh, Freddie, Freddie, no, 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 you'll hurt yourself. Get off the wall. And the grandfather intervened and said, let him learn, let him fall. He'll get back up and walk again. You know, that, that's what it is. Right. So, and Fred always felt that his grandfather really looked out for his interest as uh, as someone who was experiencing life and learning. Yeah. Um, you know, I have so many more questions to ask you, but, you know, in the interest of time, I do want to yeah. um, ask two questions that I ask of all my guests at the end of every okay. conversation. Uh, the first one is what gives you hope for the future? And the second one is what are five books, uh, fiction or nonfiction, that you would recommend to people? Uh, hmm. I think what gives me hope for the future <clears throat> is the power of learning, the power of education, the power of knowledge, and that every time you see uh, an instance in the world where, where people have an opportunity to gain a better understanding, their handling of things improves. And I think uh, there's lots of downsides to the, the world of telecommunications today, of the web, of all social media. Uh, you know, the downsides are well documented in terms of how they um, can have an impact on us that can be negative, particularly for children if they're immersed in social media. But they have a huge upside too, in my view, and that is they dramatically uh, increase the availability of information, knowledge, and understanding for people in all sorts of situations. So today, if, if, a, if a kid is, is thinking about a topic or researching a topic or, or just considering it, they can get a ton of good, useful information. Uh, they can get a lot of misinformation too. That's the problem that has to be uh, managed and, and curated, but I'm pretty confident society uh, can do that. Um, as to the, the best books, I just read a trilogy of books by a writer named Nigel Hamilton on Franklin Roosevelt in World War II. I think it's Roosevelt at war. I, I can't remember the... There's three different books, but it has a, a label for the trilogy, but Nigel Hamilton is the author. <coughs> and, um, and it's just a spectacular deconstruction of how the strategy of World War II evolved and what FDR's contributions were, what Churchill's contributions were. And uh, Hamilton got all kinds of documents that hadn't been available for 50 or 60 years. So he really was able to tell you what all the other minor players were thinking and how they were reacting. I'd, I'd say that's certainly one of them. Uh, maybe one of the best books ever written was War and Peace. I think that's 
a book everybody should read. I love McCullough's books. I, I thought Truman is the best biography I've ever read in, in my life. I thought it was just fabulous. I also enjoyed uh, John Adams, although I didn't think it was the equal uh, of the Truman book. Um, that's my that's my favorite. That's my favorite one. Adams. Love, Adams. Yeah, I loved Adams. Yeah, it's Adams. Got, and the story of how Adams, the story of how that book came about is wonderful because he started out to do a book on Adams and Jefferson. You know, mm -hmm. they were born on the same day. They died on the same day. They were adversaries through much of their lives. Uh, but he followed, he, he went into the woods. He followed the trail and he found the letters between Abigail Adams and John Adams. And it shifted the whole, the whole yeah. book in a way that, that made uh, uh, a huge difference. Oh, another uh, uh, book that I really liked and learned a lot from was The Perfect Storm uh, by um, Sebastian Younger, J-U-N-G-E-R. <clears throat> came out in the 1990s. And it's about this, this freak storm that hit New England and the North Atlantic. I think it was 92 or 93 that it hit. But Younger does a fabulous job of taking you into the action of what's going on in the storm, the boats that are at sea, uh, the, the, the ports, how they're being affected. And then he steps back and he'll give you a little lesson on how meteorology has advanced and why, you know, and how it works. And then boom, he's back into the action and he advances the action and advances the action. And then he steps back and he talks about uh, rescue, how sea rescue has evolved over the last 150 years. So he gives you a little, he gives you these vignettes that are history lessons embedded in the action. And he does it so well. One more book, if I may. Sure. Uh, Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. Mm -hmm. Blink is about how we think. And, and he, he's referring there to something he calls blink thinking. And he said, you know, there's analytical, rational reasoning. That's one way of thinking. But another way is you take all the body of experience you have and you just can see something right away. You make a decision right away. And he tells the story of, a, of uh, I think it was Thomas Hubbing, the, the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York was asked to come out to the Getty in California to look at something they were afraid was a fraud. And they brought him into the room and it was draped. Uh, you know, there was a drape over the statue and they pulled the drape back. And before the drape even was completely pulled back, having said, it's a fake. Mm. And they said, well, how do you know that? And he said, I don't know. It's just a fake. <laughs> mm. That's blink thinking, but it's very, it's a fascinating book that's really useful, I think, to understand how you're going about processing things. Yeah. Uh, before we sign off, I, um, I do want to say that uh, my, my parents came to the United States from the former Soviet Union, and they're, uh, uh, well, they're actually from Ukraine. And no consider, cons yeah, considering what's going on in the world today, um, it's, I couldn't have read your book at a better time because anytime you know it gets to a very uh you know the world seems a little bleak and um dark at times and you know i'm reminded of uh you know fred rogers uh, famous line that's used over and over again and rightfully mm -hmm. so look for the helpers and um i think um that those words you know ring true to me today and yeah, I think that if Fred were still alive, he'd be working on some programs right now. One, he'd be trying to do a program on the extraordinary, just stunning courage of the Ukrainian people. Just, you know, an example to the whole world of what's worth fighting for and how courage comes into play. And then he'd be doing another program in Poland on all the people who are taking in refugees, right. giving them homes, giving them food, uh, my wife, Peggy, and I have spent uh, the better part of the last week combing through the, the web, trying to find the right kind of charities to, to give to, to help people over there. But Fred, Fred would have seen the horror of war, but he would have tried to steer children to, to some of the, the truly beautiful things 
that uh, are there, that are part of the humanity and the humanity's response to the war. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. It was a, it was a tr real pleasure. I, I, I loved, loved, loved this book. Um, yeah. You know, if people can go out and buy it, you know, and I think it's out in paperback. Yeah, it buy is. It in buy it in paperback, hardcover, whatever you want. Uh, yeah, you won't well, regret thank it. You. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so I, much. It's a great interview. I really enjoyed, yeah, as you might imagine, I've done a hundred of these and I really enjoyed your questions. They weren't the same predictable questions. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to talk to you.